Okay, I think we are ready to start. I can see that many people have already um, joined. So, hello, hi everyone. Welcome to our Centenary Exhibition launch event. We're so happy to have you here with us and to celebrate 100 years of the Department of Information Studies. My name is Dimitrios Kranyotis and I'm the Departmental Manager in UCL Information Studies. Before we begin, I would like to go through some technical details and we'll then hand over to the presenters for our launch today. We had more than 260 registrations and I can see we have more than 150 attendees with us right now and more, and are, more and are joining. So this means that even though we really wanted to be able to see you all, this was not possible for this number of people. Therefore, we are running this launch as a webinar. This means that attendees are not able to see each other, but you can only see the uh, presenters and the panelists. The video and audio of the attendees is not activated also, but you are able to contact us uh, using the Q&A section. I know there was a delay for the exhibition website to be uploaded. That delay was purely because of server issues as it took more time than expected. So the link is the same and you can all access the exhibition there now or after this event. And for those who do not have it, we will be sharing the event later after the end of, of, of the launch. So the event is going to last uh, for maximum one hour. You will see different presenters talking about the department and the exhibition itself. We will also allocate some time for Q&A at the end of the launch around 6 p.m. So if you have any questions related to the department, the exhibition, or any stories to share from your experience in the department over the last years, please use the Q&A section at the bottom. The other attendees will not be able to see what you ask or post, but we will gather your questions and share with the speakers at the end. We also have the live transcript activated. You can activate or deactivate yours by clicking at the live transcript button below. But please note that the captions are auto-generated, so there, there might be some mistakes or it's not going to be exact at all times. I would also like to let you know that this event is being recorded and will be posted to UCL and departmental websites and social media later on. As I said before, attendees do not appear on camera, but we have to let you know that this event is recorded. So without further ado, we can start our launch of our exhibition, Geographies of Information, celebrating 100 years of UCL Department of Information Studies. And I'm going to hand over to the head of our department, Professor Elizabeth Seppert. Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Dimitri. So I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome you all here this evening for the launch of the centenary celebrations of the Department of Information Studies. As you've heard, we've got more than 150 people with us this evening, and I recognize lots of names um, in the registrations, current students, alumni, former students and staff, and present staff. And I know that there are people from all around the world with us this evening, and it's wonderful to be able to welcome you. Established as the first British School of Librarianship in 1919, our first students graduated in 1920. Over this centenary year, we've been working on a community project with many of you, which has resulted in an online exhibition celebrating our history and our contributions to the information disciplines. I want to thank everyone who has, been, who has contributed to the centenary project and especially our honorary research fellow, Dr. Alda Terracciano, who has curated the exhibition. Many people have worked very hard to bring the project to fruition as a digital manifestation. So thank you to you all. So this evening we'll launch the Centenary Publishers Prize volume, have a walk through the Centenary exhibition and timeline and talk to some of those involved in creating it. However, first of all, I'm delighted to welcome the Dean of the Arts and Humanities Faculty at UCL, Professor Stella Brutzi, who has kindly agreed to launch our centenary celebrations with a few words. Stella. Elizabeth, thank you. I'm so pleased to be here for this celebration. The Department of Information Studies, as you've just heard, sits in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at UCL. Though its inherent interdisciplinarity 
means that it has forged many significant and meaningful links with other faculties and departments, for example, the Department of Computer Science and the Faculty of Engineering, with which information studies uh, collaborates regularly around, uh, um, around digital humanities research and teaching. That it is uh, an a &H, uh, department um, su su suggests it's richly, uh, it's richly inter or more, accurate, uh, or more accurately perhaps multidisciplinarity and speaks to the importance across our disciplines of tackling academic questions from a multiplicity of perspectives. This, as we know the department, offers new insights into wicked problems and contemporary debates in our information and data rich society. It leads interdisciplinary research collaborations using critical research approaches to solve complex information problems grounded as it is uh, as it is in a distinctive coalition of researchers uh, combining social science humanities and 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 computer science scholars with expertise across information studies the department brings together a unique portfolio of international professional masters programs in library and information studies archives and records management knowledge, information and data science, di digital humanities and publishing. It teaches modules on the BAS, BSc uh, information management for, 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 for business in UCL School of Management. Its doctoral program trains the next generation of researchers and information professionals and is regarded internationally as a premium location for doctoral research. This has among the largest and most pres prestigious cohorts in the UK, attracting scholarship candidates from around the world who regularly progress to academic and senior professional posts. It boasts an enviably well-networked alumni community with, with representatives in every global region, North and South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, the Middle East and in key professional positions in national archives, libraries and cultural um, um, institutions, as well as academic high schools on several continents. This led innovations in digital humanities in Italy, China and in Latin America, in critical information literacy, in, in archive science and in the new field of community archives. Its researchers collaborate with professional and, and marginalized communities to improve information literacies for migrants, diversity in young adult publishing, lived experience for the learning disabled, care experienced adults, and in mental health recovery. Researchers tell hidden histories and, un, and, and, and unfold the stories of those whose voices were silenced including pioneering women archivists, devalued feminist labor in, in, in digital humanities, women booksellers and black cultural archives. Recent cross-disciplinary cross research has led to improved discovery and reuse of digital cultural heritage, employing inter interdisciplinary approaches between researchers from the humanities and computer science museum professionals and companies to develop innovative technology tools to bring citizens into cultural heritage institutions and to enable scholarly access. For example, the, the Enlightenment Architectures Project is working with the British Museum using computational interrogation to enhance understanding of the intellectual structures of the catalogues of, of, of Sir Hans Sloan whose collections were the foundation of the British Museum, the world's first public museum. This has also run research projects with, with significant public policy impact, such as Academic Book of the Future, which explored how scholarly work in the arts and humanities will be produced, read and preserved in future. Research under Mirror, the Memory, Identity, Rights and Records Access Project, which ran from 2017 to 2019, was, was co-produced with care experienced adults and led to a new website 
for, for, for care leavers, Family Connect. And the Celsius project facilitates access to the Office of, of National Statistics Longitudinal Study and the UK uh, uh, decennial census data. Very topical this week as Census 2021 is on Sunday the 21st of March. At no time has the department felt more, more relevant to our academic needs than it does now. And this will continue to play a crucial role in UCL's future. Many of you here know that UCL is building a second campus on, on the Olympic Park Stratford. This is integral to those plans, having contributed to the foundation of an MA in public history and to the creation of two new undergraduate programs Go, go, going through validation this term, the, the, the BA Creative and Applied Humanities and a BSc in, in Information Studies. Here then is to the next hundred years. Elizabeth, back to you. Thank you so much, Stella. That's absolutely wonderful. Thank you. So um, I want to give a brief sketch of our history since we are celebrating our first 100 years. In November 1917, the president of the Library Association, Sir John McAllister, wrote to the provost of UCL, quotes, to inquire whether it would be possible to institute at University College a school of librarianship to be established in cooperation with the Library Association. The director of the LSE commented at the time that, quote, the number of new recruits to librarianship was so small as to preclude any hope of making an institution of that kind successful. I'm very pleased to say that over the past century, we have proved that prediction to be entirely wrong. The School of Librarianship at UCL was established with funding from the Carnegie Trust and in collaboration with the Library Association. Dr. Ernest Baker, secretary to the Education Committee of the LA, was appointed as the first director. And Sir Frederick Kenyon, director and principal librarian of the British Museum, delivered the opening address in October 1919. We had a very large intake in the first year of 88 students. Many students were and still are female, a distinctive characteristic of librarianship and cognate disciplines, which continues to the present day. During the Second World War, the Lib School of Librarianship was suspended, but it reopened in 1945. The new director, Raymond Irwin, reported that the demand for places was stimulated by the flow of students from the services. Many libraries have been replenishing or expanding their staffs and successful students have found little difficulty in obtaining suitable posts after training. Sir Hilary Jenkinson, Deputy Keeper of the Public Record Office, took the opportunity to petition the Provost of UCL to establish a School of and Diploma of Archival Science. It took two years to get the proposal through the college and university bureaucracies. But in October 1947, we achieved another first, the University Diploma in Archive Administration. I have to admit, that Liverpool University also started an archives diploma that year, but I'm still going to claim this as a first. As many of you know, Jenkinson gave the inaugural lecture on the English archivist, a new profession. We were renamed School of Librarianship and Archives. Over the next few decades, we added more disciplines to our teaching and to our title. In 1972, we began an MSc in Information Science and added information studies becoming SLACE, which many of you will remember. The first staff wedding of which I'm aware, and dare I say it, the most famous, was between two young lecturers who joined the school in the 1960s, Aya Thorold and John McElwain. Aya McElwain, as she became, represents another first for us. She was the first female professor of library and information studies and director of the school. Although I'm sorry to say we had to wait until 1995 for that. Digital Humanities emerged under a new director, Susan Hockey, who had joined us in 2000 and became director. She established the new masters in digital humanities. And I'm delighted that Susan is among our former staff who agreed to be interviewed about her work as part of the centenary, so you can hear more. 
Our fifth discipline is publishing. Professor Ian Stevenson established the UCL Centre for Publishing in 2006, and he ran the MA in Publishing until his retirement in 2015. However, by this time, we'd given up trying to fit ever more subjects into our title. So in 2009, we became Department of Information Studies, DIS. There are many aspects of our history which have yet to be explored, not least the intellectual contributions we have made in emerging fields such as knowledge organisation. Mary Piggott's work on cataloguing and classification, Professor McElwain's work on classification and bibliographic control, Emeritus Professor Broughton's classification research on the structuring of terminologies, and also the work of many of our students, including Jean Aitchison, who was a pioneer in the field of thesaurus construction and the use of facet analysis in building control vocabularies. And of course, SR Ranganathan, who developed the first major classi faceted classification system in the 1920s among his many other achievements. So this evening, we are celebrating both the history and the future of this department. We will shortly hear from our, our honorary research fellow and exhibition curator, Alda Terracciano. But first, I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Daniel Boswell, who has facilitated the Publishers Prize volume, which this year celebrated the theme of libraries. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you very much, um, Elizabeth. Um, it's a great pleasure to, despite being, as you've kind of described, the new kids on the block for publishing <laughs> within, within the department, to be able to speak here today and have the opportunity to, to launch and present this latest volume of the Publishers Prize Anthology, one of the contributions that our program has been able to make to UCL and to the department. We've been running the anthology since 2014, so this latest edition represents our seventh volume and excitingly uh, it has been largely designed and produced in conjunction with one of our then sitting MA publishing students who's joining me this evening, Manon Wright. Thank you Manon for joining us. Um, who can talk a little bit about some of the design <laughs> for it. Just before we um, begin that I just want to explain that it's it was quite a long road for our students in working on this volume. We, we each year set about to create and design a book with a particular theme. And given the centenary uh, and the connections that we had within the department to context regarding librarianship and book spaces, um, it felt like the perfect opportunity to present a volume that can really speak to that. Uh, the end result is a volume that that the programme and the students are very proud of, despite the long gestation because of the various <laughs> situations that we've all experienced over this year um, in, in releasing that title. Um, but it's, it's a volume with the theme of libraries as its, as its stated um, thematic concern. The stories and poetry uh, within the volume speak to a variety of concerns that we might understand as being related to information, information procuration, preservation, and presentation. Um, and I'm excited now that it can finally be presented to the public. And once we can get back on campus and have access to the stock, we'll be providing the links and details about access to purchase for this prize so that we can send out those volumes to all of the contributors and all of those of you who are interested in having a copy for yourselves. Um, thank you very much. Manon, uh, I hope it's all right for me to hand over to you now just to speak a bit about your inspiration for the cover design, the layout, um, and also the logo and things that you can see behind a number of us here this evening. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak at this event. It's a great honor. Uh, I designed this cover in uh, conjunction with uh, the event as well as in um, with the theme of libraries. Um, I, I'll speak with Alda later about the um, development of the concept, but um, Basically, I wanted to get that idea of um, like uh, universities and um, like academics. So I designed this logo to um, reflect like the uh, like educational like library stamps and like that sort of idea. I also um, I tried to 
maintain some sort of consistency with the previous volumes, but um, make it more individual. I also designed these little like sort of chapter heading illustrations. Um, most of them are thematically uh, connected to different ways of um, storing information like on CDs, floppy disks, um, writing, things like that. So uh, yeah, like um, chips and uh, books, different ways that we've um, tried to uh, record knowledge. Uh, same with, uh, and I tried to incorporate this particular logo to reflect the UCL sort of building and institution along with the idea of libraries and informational studies. Um, yeah. And the cover concept, Manon, the, the cover concept that's presented behind you of the design, will you talk us through mm -hmm. what the idea was there? Yeah, uh, the idea was the different sorts of ways that we recorded knowledge. I wanted to go from the organic to the inorganic, if that makes sense, like through like um, passing down knowledge verbally uh, from person to person. That's the idea of the neurons going on to the ink and pen of like uh, written knowledge in books to the way that we uh, convey knowledge most of the time now, which is through like chips and like uh, digital um, information, which is reflected in the uh, circuit board. So I wanted it to be like sort of an evolution through um, the ways that we have uh, shared uh, libraries and uh, information. Thank you so much. Um, I think that that's a perfect summary really for some of the wonderful evolution of the department through its ages. Um, I'm very excited for people to get a chance to read some of the stories in there. I'm sure we have probably a few alums here viewing tonight and some of you may have contributed stories to it. Thank you to all those contributors. They are fantastic and I can't wait to hear what people think of the volume. Thank you for joining us, Manon. Dimitri, I'm gonna hand back to My you pleasure. now, okay? Thank you both. Um, so yes, I'm just gonna hand over to Dr. Alda Terracciano, who is our curator for this exhibition, and she's going to present everything related to the exhibition now. Alda. Uh, thank you, Dimitri. And uh, first of all, I would actually like to uh, thank everybody who's uh, present at the webinar behind the scenes. We cannot see you, but we really appreciate your um, presence. Um, I think uh, we all know um, what Zoom fatigue is these days. <laughs> it's a new word which has entered our strange new vocabulary. Uh, and in a sense, it's uh, really not just a word, but a physical reality for us. So uh, we really appreciate you being here tonight uh, to celebrate with us um, this important event, uh, the centenary of our beloved department. Um, secondly, I would like to thank our Dean, uh, Professor Stella uh, Bruzzi and uh, our head of department, um, Elizabeth Shepherd, because with their trust and their support, they've really been the ones that two pillars for this exhibition to happen. And, um, and, and, and really, I should say that this started as a simple idea of, you know, a communal celebration of the department centenary. Um, and progressively, it has grown into an ambitious archival reconstruction and digital representation of the department's history as well as an oral history um, project, which has involved students, alumni, former members of staff, and I will say a little bit more about this in, 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 in a moment. Um, in particular, Elizabeth um, has been incredibly generous uh, in sharing with me her knowledge of the department. Those crucial moments in the growth from the school to one of the most renowned university departments of, university, of information studies in the world. And so um, for a curator 
I have to say this is an absolute luxury um, to have someone um, with your knowledge, um, um, Elizabeth. So um, yes, thank you so much uh, for having shared it with me and through me, obviously, then uh, with everybody else uh, who will be accessing this exhibition. Um, the other crucial ingredient in the making of this work um, has been the enthusiasm and the professionalism of all the students involved. We shouldn't forget that students enrolling in, uh, at the department often are already professionals. They already work. They are already there in, in, in a number of you know, professional um, uh, roles. And then they decide to come to the department to refine certain skills or to gain new skills. And, um, and in, in this sense, I was extremely lucky to have the opportunity to work uh, with the students and, um, and to have the support of another pillar of the department, uh, Dr. Andrew Flynn, who's reader in archival studies and oral history, and kindly collaborated with me in the recruitment of the students for um, the oral history program and training them. Because my idea was very much to explore this whole concept of um, intersectionality as well as interdisciplinarity by having students from different uh, courses involved in the oral history. So they needed an efficient and fast training in, uh, in this art of the oral history. And, uh, and I have to say, Andrew was phenomenal um, in his support. So um, if you're there, Andrew, thank you so much. Um, so back in October, 2019, which is when these all started, <laughs> I met with Manon through Daniel. Uh, my idea was that the project somehow had to start with an image because that image would have carried us through the process, would have been an inspiration for all of us and would have been also a kind of beacon um, uh, to lead um, the, the whole conceptual framework for the work. So when I met with Manon, uh, we talked about the, the importance of us as human beings in producing and consuming data and information, past, present and future, but really how could we retain the central part in this all incredible game of information? Uh, which at times seems to uh, be a little bit lost um, in terms of how we can control it and, and, and the directions it takes. So um, when I met with uh, Manon, who is uh, obviously, as you can see, a brilliant uh, artist, uh, we started discussing, as she said uh, earlier on, uh, this whole idea of um, the world of libraries and how you know, this, this whole concept could be included uh, in the image without losing sight of those uh, uh, artistic elements like colors, for example. I, I had this idea of um, really moving from sepia to blue, uh, which I think Manon just interpreted in, in an absolutely stunning yeah. and beautiful way. So Manon, would you like to just, you know, interject a little bit here yeah. and just, well, uh, yeah. When you talked about the sepia and the blues, that kind of immediately brought to mind the idea of going from the inorganic, from the organic to the inorganic, because the sepia is like the color of pages, like naturalistic, the more human part. And then kind of it gave me the inspiration to like incorporate the technology together, because we think of that as sort of the blue scion kind of colors, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah, uh, I think when you spoke about those colors, it kind of pushed me further away from 
immediately um, thinking about the idea as like a traditional library because I could have easily kind of illustrated like, you know, libraries of Alexandria, sort of like the more traditional ideas, but I wanted to take it more to the modern sort of idea of libraries. And I think with your suggestion, even though you said like the Renaissance man, the, the colors also made me think of like other possibilities, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, so, that, so the colors were what kind of led me to the idea of like the triptych of the different sort of um, uh, styles of libraries. Mm. And the other thing is, yeah. uh, because obviously now you graduated, but when we met, you were a student. And in a sense, um, it was uh, obviously this was also part of your process of learning and mm -hmm. engaging with the professional world. How does it feel actually for you to have created an image that not only has been published physically on a book, but is now part of an exhibition, which is, uh, you know, digital and can be seen on so many different platforms, is actually your background now, yeah. like everybody else's background apart from me, obviously, because my laptop does not support it, but hey, that's another story. <laughs> no, it's How a huge it honor. I, I was really excited. Like, um, I, I feel so lucky to be, put in the position to be able to be like one of the representatives of this centenary and also to have the book hopefully soon be able to be bought by people you know and like to have people be able to have it themselves um I, I've done like small other things previously as an illustrator but nothing to this scale so um yeah it, it feels so really good Thank yeah, you. so I think for me, you see, this 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 was very much uh, the driving force behind the whole idea of then involving students in the process uh, of creating the exhibition, because um, the uh, idea that professionalism is not only provided by giving students um, theories, but it's also done by engaging on the ground with creating is also part of the history and the tradition of the department. The department started as a school and it started as a school where alongside academic subjects, there would be practical uh, workshops on book binding and uh, book pressing and a, and, and, and a number of other activities. So, in a sense, for me, the idea of creating this centenary exhibition was also to relieve the experience and to actually practice their heritage and practice, um, um, in a sense, what it's written on the label. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much, Manon, for confirming that. And um, I'm not sure, Dimitri, if we have Charles with us now. Do we? Uh, no, we don't. Okay. So um, I, I basically, I hope Charles could uh, join us tonight. Uh, Charles Farugia is the, um, actually uh, the archivist of the uh, National Archives in Malta. And he is one of the alumni who's been interviewed uh, by the students. But um, what really I think for me is important here is to basically highlight the role that um, uh, the alumni themselves then have played in supporting this process, uh, this participatory creative process by giving the students who uh, were trained in the oral history and then delivered uh, obviously all these interviews. Aldo, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think we have Charles. So hi, whenever you want, he can unmute, unmute yes. himself and uh, he can join the conversation. Okay. Do I need to mute myself? No, no, no. Charles will, um, will unmute himself ah, okay. if he's here. And he will hi, do. I'm here. Oh, Charles, can we see you as well? I don't think we can, but let's proceed like that and I'll try in the meantime to... Okay, all right. Wonderful, Charles. So uh, this is so great. Thank you so much for joining us from Malta with your 
time difference and everything. And uh, it's a Friday late uh, afternoon for you, I think now. Um, uh, just, just one hour difference, no problem with that. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> So, uh, Charles, yes, as I said, um, you were one of the alumni who actually was part of this creative process and uh, you uh, were interviewed on the 6th of March 2020, so it's a year ago now, uh, by Mohammed Ben Tayek. Uh, and your interview was really absolutely fascinating. And I should say for everybody who's here listening that all the full podcasts of all the interviews with the alumni are published on the website um, and we will talk a little bit more about this but um, uh, if it's possible Charles I just wanted to ask you uh, a couple of questions the first one is you studied at UCL and I mean it, it seems to me from the from the interview that actually the department had quite an impact in terms of your professional career, but not only yours, also Malta. Can you say something about that? Yes, um, glad, glad to be with you um, this evening. And as you said, um, the, the interview was quite some time ago, but um, it, when, when the invitation for the interview came, uh, it, was, it was a nice surprise because basically, Time really flies. I was I, I studied at UCL 20 years ago. Basically, I was there 2020, uh, uh, 2000 and 2001. So basically, it's it's amazing how how time time flies. And at that time um, in Malta, we were setting up the national archives. So basically, I was one of two employees at at that time at this new national archive. So basically. I had a great say in, in, in the formation of the National Archives. I had already been working at the archives for 10 years and coming there and getting training, uh, professional training, getting exposure to the TNA and uh, British Library and Wellcome Trust and all that uh, actually um, made a big impact in, in my academic formation, which then I basically um, put into the formation of the National Archives and later in 2005, even um, the, the formulation of courses, archives courses at the University of Malta. So basically now we do have a department that uh, teaches archives and records management, which was basically the result of, of my studies at, at UCL. Amazing, fantastic. I mean, it's just some, you know, these gems, these discoveries that I have made along the way have been absolutely so illuminating. And, and, and also, the other thing that you shared in your interview, which uh, was very powerful for me, was the work that you have done with migrants in Malta. And these all, the exhibition has an entire section, which is on social justice. Uh, because we also need to remember the role that information professionals play in, 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 in relation to social justice in the world today. And so could you say just a few words about that, Charles? Yes. Um, uh, lately, with regards to the National Archives, we have started, we have embarked on, on a project called Memoria, which is basically um, an oral history project. Um, and uh, we tried as much as possible to um, to, to, to build this project based on the oral history methodology, but more than that, uh, on sound archival principles. And uh, in so doing, we tried as much as possible to go for teams that maybe were not um, that strongly represented in the archival record, in the formal archival record. So basically, one of the issues in, in Malta, as it's in Italy, in Lampedusa, in all these places, is migration. Um, we have a long history of migration, um, and basically we're trying to capture even that topic under the umbrella term of memoria. We're capturing not only migration, there are other themes of social justice that uh, maybe we were overlooking a bit because the archival, the, the official public record is sometimes quite rigid in its in its um, creation and in, in, in its maintenance. Uh, but through this oral history project, through memoria, we're reaching out uh, 
basically to an unlimited uh, array of teams uh, that most of them do touch yes on social justice. Mm. Thank you so much, Charles. So as you can see, uh, the points that were raised in these interviews and were um, in a sense already sketched in conversations which I had with a number of experts uh, at the department were then obviously developed and um, um, captured by the students in their conversations in ways that probably sometimes not even books manage. So in a sense, the exhibition became also a kind of publication in its own terms. And in a sense, so far so good. I mean, everything was progressing well and we were all very happy and things were um, uh, going uh, really well. And then, of course, as we all know, the most disruptive thing happened, which is our beloved COVID-19. And with COVID-19, this idea that we had of presenting the exhibition in the south and north cloisters of the Wilkins building uh, was obviously had to be put aside. So why am I mentioning this? Because at that point, um, um, we kind of had to step back, have a look at what we had done at that point, and reconfigure the space that we wanted to create to celebrate the history of the department. Um, honestly, without Dimitri Craniotis and Fernando Santos, uh, we wouldn't really be talking about having an exhibition today because it was thanks again you know, to their trust in me and the trust in the possibility of then migrating everything onto a digital virtual platform that um, the exhibition was then created. Um, and um, back in August this time, when everybody was um, going through the aftermath of the first wave of COVID, uh, Fernando managed to organize uh, a visit um, on my own to the cloisters and I took my camera and I started taking pictures of the space and in that space obviously completely empty in a, in a kind of yearly way uh, I started also recording the sound or the absence the absence of sound and in that space the voices of um, the alumni uh, and the, the interviewers kind of started resonating and this is how then I started conceiving this um, virtual uh, environment which I would like now to share with you with the support of Sienna Griffin Show uh, the amazing 3D designer who's based at the Bartlett School of Architecture and who then, like um, Manon, um, listened carefully to the intentions, um, looked at the material, the visual material that I had collected, and then with me started creating this uh, quite beautiful space. Um, so Fiona, uh, the Sienna, are you there? Yes. Uh, okay. So Sienna is now leading us into the entrance of the space, which you can see um, has uh, basically has been designed as a 3D space based on the photographic material um, as well as um, her incredible drawing skills. The exhibition is divided in three sections. We have Bloomsbury and the School of Librarianship, Publishing and the Practice of Archiving, and then Social Justice, Internationalism and Digital Futures. Now, the way you navigate the uh, exhibition, you go through the various rooms. So if we go, for example, to Bloomsbury and the school, um, the first one, uh, you will see that you have 
the panels themselves that you can enlarge and click on and see the historical documents, but you can also listen to excerpts from these long interviews that somehow juxtapose against the past and kind of bring that past alive in the lived experiences of the alumni and the professionals. I also had uh, a little touch, which is a um, voiceover of Raymond Irwin introduction. Uh, can we play that? We cannot hear it, Sienna. Okay, um, so this is probably not possible to do. I'm stretching the limits of the virtual here. <laughs> Are you able to hear this? Sorry. Yes, I'm able to hear the background sound. And uh, were you able to hear Raymond? Sorry. No. Oh, he's so loud in my ears. I couldn't hear anything, <laughs> anything <laughs> else. Um, apologies. I'll just um, stop sharing and I'll reshare and see if that does anything else. Shall I try um, yes. Raymond Irwin again? Yeah. In that isolated but not always quiet corner of Bloomsbury, known as Mallet Place, there lies immediately between University College and the National Central Library a building of pleasant and seemly aspect, known as Chaucer House. This is in a true sense the headquarters and citadel of British librarianship, for here are placed the offices, council chamber, library and members room of the Library Association. The National Central Library adjoins and can be reached by a private doorway. The London University School of Librarianship and University College Library are across the way. The British Museum, the Senate House and the University Library are within two or three minutes walking distance. Within the radius of half a mile lie the great libraries belonging to a score or more national and academic institutions. Thus placed at the heart of things, it is the Piccadilly Circus of librarianship, where sooner or later one meets everyone connected with libraries of bibliography. This is beautiful. Thank you so much, Sina. So as you can see, the whole idea in, in creating this virtual space was how can we continue that relational nature that I had established in the process of creating the exhibition, in the co-creation of the exhibition with all the participants, and how could that temporality, this concept of time being incorporated in the design. Um, can we go to the bell, um, which is um, another uh, section of the libraries. Um, and here, what you can see is actually a 3D reconstruction of um, the library bell. And the library bell is, um, you can read all about the story of the library bell. Uh, if you click on it, maybe we can render. Um, but basically the whole idea with the model was to be able to see these objects anew and immerse the objects themselves in sound compositions. I don't know if you can also um, click on the sound for this. Um, and then go back to the object. So what 
what you have here is actually original recording of Westminster bells because this bell was actually done by fusing the metal of Westminster bells. And, and it, I mean, the, the history of the object was then reconstructed uh, by myself in, um, in this sound editing, which uh, you will be able to enjoy uh, later on on your own. Um, and, and so in a sense, the materiality of the object uh, has been reinterpreted through its history via the sounds, sounds that I collected from the British Library, um, as well as uh, the real locations at UCL. Um, so this is really just a snapshot and I should really be stopping here because these are seven rooms solidly full of archival material. Um, you know, interviews, um, you have uh, original sound recordings from the British Library, which have never been shared outside the British Library. It took a year to get copyright clearances for these objects. So it's really um, a, a treat for all of us. And um, I'd like really to thank um, again, um, Sienna publicly for all the work that she has done uh, with me to um, make the exhibition uh, possible. Um, so I think, Dimitri, I will stop here. I have certainly overrun uh, with time, knowing myself. Um, well, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. We have some questions, but um, I'll just go through them. Um, first question, I think that is for Elizabeth. If given that the School of Archives was established in 1947, if we have any plans for the 75th anniversary next year, that's from Ian. Um, I think that's an excellent excuse to have the actual <laughs> party, right? So, so um, assuming we can, um, I think we should um, aim to have a, a real life party on campus in the cloisters maybe, um, or in the Flaxman Gallery, which have been part of the original plans. So yes, for sure. I think we should make a date for 2022. That Thank would you, be Ian. a lovely excuse. Yes. Very good. Um, some very nice words from Nick Poole, who is the chief executive of CILIP, that it has been wonderful to hear tonight's discussions and he wanted to send their warm congratulations on behalf of everyone at CILIP, today's library association. So they would love to know whether um, we see the next 100 years as a century of radical disruption in information science, or if there are central principles that are continuous with the past. So that's to Elizabeth, to Alda, to Stella, to whoever, Daniel, to whoever wants to comment on this. Who would go first? Who's gonna? So um, I think, yes underlying principles and I mentioned a few of the sort of research threads that have in, in knowledge organization just as one example because that's kind of one of the longest running um, themes in research terms in the school as was the school um, and I think that some of those are fundamental principles uh, and critical questions which perpetuate and which frame the the work that we do but clearly um, looking at the past 100 years in information studies and thinking about even what might be possible in the next couple of decades of uh, transformational technologies, completely different ways of thinking about information in society, which just would not have occurred to you know, Raymond Irwin, for example, um, and his very proper understanding of what a proper library is or was, um, it, things will be completely different, I'm absolutely sure. But Alda may have picked up on one or two issues from the, the themes that you brought out in, in, in preparing the exhibition. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very, very interesting question. Thank you so much for asking it, because I think the disruption that we are going to see is also about the uh, traditional way in which we have seen the role of information professionals so far. So disruption is not just technological, but it's also societal. And um, uh, the wonderful uh, Vanda Broughton, uh, at the end of her two and a half hours uh, interview, she actually made a wonderful comment. And she mentioned uh, how the neutrality 
of the librarian and the informational professionals. And she mentions uh, the creed of a librarian um, um, that you know many librarians have been trained on, the book which uh, basically Goldsmith's um, a book on um, how to become a librarian and, and what would be a librarian. Um, and, 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 and having neutrality at the core of it, she actually challenges that. And she's uh, starting considering if at this moment in time, actually librarians shouldn't be um, uh, taking a different kind of role in tackling um, 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 inequalities and injustices uh, in the record keeping system and representation of those records across the board. So um, in a sense, I think we will see quite a lot of disruption and this emerges from the conversations that we've had, uh, that the students have had and, and somehow I have had by editing them. <laughs> um, um, and so I really, I, I really look forward to the comments uh, that you all might make through the uh, open forum section of the website, uh, which we're going to launch next week. Thank you, Alda. Um, thanks to Duncan McKay and Anastasia Karameos for the nice words and everyone else who wrote nice words um, in the Q&A section. Um, I think we are very close to the end. Um, I just wanted to remind people that you will be receiving an email with the link. You have already received that, but it's going to be complete very soon. So you will be able to visit the exhibition and enjoy properly what Alda has uh, shown us today. I just wanted to ask if we have any closing remarks from Stella, from Elizabeth, from Alda or anyone else, Daniel, anyone else? I just wanted to say in closing, um, to propose a toast to the past, present and future of the Department of Information Studies and to all the wonderful people who make up the community, which we're very proud to lead. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for helping us celebrate our centenary. Thank you to everybody. And there are so many people. If I made a list, I would miss people out. So um, thank you to the so many people who've contributed to, to the wonderful exhibition. Um, and um, enjoy the exhibition when you get to see it. And thank you for coming this evening. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Cheers. <laughs> It's been an amazing event and the exhibition and when you know it, it is such a privilege it's all you know to be surrounded by 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 uh such amazing colleagues and students uh so you know um we'll all really really enjoy uh visiting the virtual um exhibition and sort of partly you know i it don't never forget. Yes, it, it is about tradition. We're celebrating a hundred years, but never underestimate the capacity of um, innovation and of technological advances to really change the way in which we interact with and understand the world. And in looking at at, at the department's history, that's something which came out again and again that the two go hand in hand, which is what makes it such an amazing place where you know that is both about critical inquiry and about practice and how the two fuse fuse together it's been wonderful thank you so much Stella and thank you everybody thank you everybody yes and helping evening. us celebrate thank, thank, you. You. thank you bye bye